All right, so today we're going to do a brief overview of QGIS as well as a, uh, a feature frenzy. So as Bill said, my name is Sean Pickett. I'm a data analyst for Century Engineering. Um, and in my day-to-day -day work, I do all things data, whether it's uh, workflow automation, um, uh, data analysis, uh, mapping, um, database design, uh, so on and so forth. Um, our particular group within Century Engineering, our, uh, the GIS group, um, we are a little bit unique uh, in the state of Maryland in that we um, thoroughly embrace open source uh, technologies, um, one of which is uh, QGIS that I'll be talking to you about today. I will say though, uh, we do have licensing and capabilities within the ArcGIS realm, um, and, uh, but our preference is to stick with open source uh, solutions. Um, so with that out of the way, let's get started. So we're, um, we're gonna do a brief overview of what QGIS is and some of the high level uh, capabilities of it. Uh, we're gonna dive into a feature frenzy. Um, from there, uh, as Bill indicated, I'll uh, uh, briefly discuss the Maryland QGIS uh, user group, and then we'll end off with some Q and A. All right. So um, as Bill ha has already kind of stated, uh, QGIS is a free and open source desktop GIS software. Uh, it's uh, designed and implemented with open standards and with uh, open um, uh, uh, programming languages. It has tight integration with other um, open source um, uh, products such as uh, Postgres and uh, GeoServer. Um, and it's an official uh, uh, project of the Open Source uh, Geospatial Foundation. And it runs on just about everything. All right, um, let's go over some terminology. So first we have coordinate reference system. Um, this is essentially the same thing as the spatial reference system uh, term that's used um, within the ArcGIS realm. Additionally, um, I'll probably be uh, switching back and forth between some of these terminologies and I do apologize because I do kind of straddle the fence between uh, QGIS and ArcGIS. But in the QGIS realm, they're called processing algorithms. And in ArcGIS, you commonly call them uh, geoprocessing tools. Uh, QGIS has a, a project file similar to a map document in Arc Desktop or a project file in Arc Pro. Uh, there's two variants. The first is a .qgz or a, a, a QGS, excuse me, which is a standalone uh, project file. And then from there, there's also a QGZ, which is a zipped up version that has an optional QGD uh, or auxiliary data uh, database that's coupled with it. Um, similar to ArcGIS, we also have layer files, a QML and a QLR. The QML just stores the layer or, uh, the layer style, while the QR, QLR stores the layer um, style as well as a pointer to the data. All right, so let's briefly talk about how QGIS is set up. So when you first install QGIS, you have a default profile. Um, and we'll be touching a little bit here and there on what a profile is, but essentially you can think of it like a, um, a user account on a computer where each user will have their own folder. So within your particular installation of QGIS, you can have multiple profiles. And as I said, by default, you're gonna have one. So when you open up QGIS, it's gonna load the global settings from your current profile or from your default profile if you haven't added more. Um, and then from there, your uh, 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 project file will contain the layers uh, that then point to the data. Um, and as I've uh, briefly mentioned, there's also the uh, possibility of having auxiliary data um, and then the um, standalone layer files that can be exported out uh, from your layers. Um, again, I'll briefly touch on this, but you can have multiple profiles and I'll be explaining what the benefit of that is in just a moment. Uh, so next we have the interface. Um, so at its core, QGIS is really three main things. It's a menu bar up top that's stationary. It's a status bar down at the bottom, which is also stationary. And then it's a, a large map, um, a map view in the middle. Uh, from there, uh, you can have any number of toolbars and panels. Um, these toolbars and panels can be moved and docked uh, in, in any place within QGIS along the top, uh, the left side, the right side, or the bottom. Additionally, you can actually add um, multiple um, or additional map views 
uh, for both 2D and 3D data. Um, and likewise, you can uh, dock those within the interface um, or you can pull them out and have them be standalone windows. So uh, next, uh, QGIS provides a number of different ways to customize the interface. Um, all of these options are found under the settings menu uh, up at the top. And so first under settings and options, you have uh, the ability to control what uh, font uh, you're using as well as the size of the font. You, you can also control the icon size. So for instance, if, if I was doing a, um, a live demo of what QGIS is for uh, an audience like this, I would actually increase the size of the font and the icon size to make it a little bit easier to see. Um, from there, you can also see on the two images to the right, uh, you can control the styling. So this includes both the theming in the sense that, you know, the top one is a dark theme and the bottom one is a light theme. Um, and you can also control kind of how the drop down menus and the buttons look. Uh, so for instance, you know, uh, you, you can think of the difference between a menu in something like um, um, a Mac versus something, um, an application that's running on uh, Windows. You can um, make them look and feel in the same way. Uh, so next up under settings, interface customization, um, we have the ability to control um, the visibility of menus, um, uh, toolbars, and panels. So what this actually means is you can turn them off uh, from the interface entirely. Uh, so this might seem a little strange or sound a little strange at first, but this really comes in handy when you're setting up the QGIS interface for someone that may not be as proficient with GIS, um, or maybe you're setting up um, a, um, a profile for yourself in which you wanna streamline the interface to just the buttons and the panels um, that you actually are gonna use on your day-to-day -day, uh, tasks. Uh, the other thing that you can turn on and off is the data providers. So again, maybe you don't ever use um, uh, IBM DB2 or SQL Server, you can turn those providers off. Um, and I'll, um, I think I've mentioned this before, but um, you, know, you, you can have multiple um, uh, profiles and all of the settings that I'm talking about here are actually stored within your profile. So this makes it so that for instance, you could set up a profile uh, specifically for editing raster data or maybe another profile for uh, editing and analyzing uh, 3D data. Um, or maybe one, uh, you know, specifically for um, a, a cartography uh, uh, purposes. And from there, you could customize the interface uh, as you see fit. Um, the last uh, uh, section under settings uh, that I'll talk about here is the user profiles. So this just allows you to manage um, user profiles and switch between them. All right. Uh, like um, uh, many of the GIS software out there, it allows you to interact with a number of different data types. Uh, we have raster and vector, which are pretty standard. Um, you can um, uh, pull in and uh, work with uh, mesh data sets, uh, 2.5 and 3D data sets, as well as uh, uh, temporal data sets. And I should say all of this uh, functionality is native to QGIS. Uh, it doesn't require any additional uh, plugins or add-ons or anything along those lines. So next we have some formats. So all the formats you see on the screen, uh, QGIS can both read from and export out to. Uh, the one exception would be AutoCAD DWG. Um, while QGIS can read from um, an AutoCAD DWG, um, it does, um, you know, because the, um, a DWG file is a proprietary file format, there are some limitations with certain versions of the DWG and certain limitations on what you can do. Um, but all of the rest of these files uh, can be easily um, uh, worked with within QGIS. Um, I should also say as well that this is just a small subset of kind of the common um, uh, uh, data formats. So for each one of these vector and raster, there's somewhere around uh, 30 to 50 different data uh, uh, formats that QGIS uh, can support. So I would recommend uh, taking a look if you don't see the format that you're used to using. Uh, next, we have um, uh, databases and web. So on the databases side, we have two kind of local uh, uh, database formats. We have the geo package and the file geo database uh, from ArcGIS. And then we have the enterprise level databases like Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, and IBM DB2. 
Um, on the website, uh, QGIS supports all OGC web services, as well as uh, the map feature and image uh, services that, um, that are published by, uh, uh, through ESRI or through ArcMap. Um, and then you can also consume XYZ tiles and vector tiles uh, directly from the web as well. In, in addition to kind of the basic features of a, of a GIS software, QGIS also offers a model builder, uh, you know, very similar to what you would get in ArcGIS or um, a, a desktop or pro. Uh, they have their own um, uh, Python um, uh, library for working with uh, all of the data called PyQGIS. Uh, it's similar to what you would get in ArcGIS uh, using ArcPy. Um, one thing that I will note though, uh, and this is one of the things that makes QGIS uh, special in this regard, is that PyQGIS actually also exposes the interface of uh, QGIS as well. So this would allow you, for instance, to add your own um, buttons, dialog boxes, toolbars, panels, menus, uh, so on and so forth within QGIS using PyQGIS. Uh, but beyond that, it offers many of the same uh, types of functionality that you would get in ArcPy, um, whether you're working with uh, maps or working with layers, working with the data itself, the geoprocessing tools, so on and so forth. Um, and PyQGIS um, can be uh, accessed um, and uh, implemented, I should say, in QGIS through scripts, which are essentially like tools, um, uh, through the expression builder, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, as well as through plugins, which is where you would be able to have a um, your own interface in QGIS. You would be able to create your own panel, toolbar, uh, menus, and so on and so forth. Um, next, we have the QGIS server. So this is a server that comes packaged with a, a QGIS desktop that allows you to publish OGC uh, uh, web services. And then the last two on the list, QField and Input, um, these aren't officially supported by QGIS. Uh, they're actually developed and maintained by two private companies. Um, but these two projects um, allow for collecting field data. Uh, QField is only available on Android. Input's available on uh, iOS and, and, and Android. Um, and both of these products essentially take a, a, a very similar approach in that um, they, they pull directly from the QGIS um, uh, desktop project file. So it's, it, it becomes kind of a what you see is what you get type of interface in that regard, which is, it makes setting these up very nice uh, because you don't have to have, um, you know, an intermediate step to develop what this thing's going to look like. All right. Um, next we have the development life cycle. Um, so to kind of demystify the, the version numbers for uh, QGIS, um, we have uh, even numbers and odd numbers. So the even numbers represent um, the release, so 3.10 and 3.14. Uh, the odd numbers are for the nightly builds of the development versions. Generally speaking, you're only going to use the, the, the even number um, releases, um, but if you are looking to test things out you, and, and you know what you're doing, um, you may uh, dip into the development or the nightly build uh, odd numbers. From there, the release types are divided into two. Uh, one is the long-term release and the other is the latest. Uh, the current long-term release is 3.10 and the current latest is 3.14. Um, so the long-term release uh, is an, an, an annual, um, is updated uh, annually every February. Uh, this is nice because you have a, um, uh, a prescribed um, a timeline for when the next LTR would come out. Um, Whereas the latest release uh, is updated every three to six months with a minor version. So it'll go from 3.14 to 3.16 uh, uh, to 3.18, so on and so forth. Uh, both release types um, uh, publish uh, point releases uh, every month. And then here for those that will uh, um, get access to the slides later on is the help documentation for the LTR and the latest. And with that, I will dive into the feature frenzy. So let's start off with cartography. So uh, similar to uh, ArcGIS, you know, Arc Desktop, Arc Pro, uh, QGIS allows you to make maps. Um, I would challenge you, and the reason why, um, you know, I, I would 
um, I prefer to use the term layouts, which is QGIS's term, is that layouts in QGIS are so much more than just maps. So every project file in QGIS can have multiple layouts. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the layout manager, which allows you to um, uh, add, delete, uh, duplicate um, the layout that you currently have, as well as open them up. Uh, additionally, every layout can also have multiple pages. So you can create a single page layout, um, but if you add uh, multiple pages, uh, you have the option to actually change uh, the orientation uh, and the page size, as well as the map views that interact with that particular uh, page independent of the other pages. So where this could be useful is, um, you know, maybe you're developing a map um, that's going to be a large plot in ANSI D or an ANSI E. And in addition to that map, uh, you want to also develop an eight and a half by 11 as a handout for the meeting. Um, you could do so within a single map layout. Um, similar to a data-driven pages and ArcGIS desktop, we also have what QGIS calls Atlas. Uh, so Atlas is um, pretty much the same thing as a data-driven page you know, set up a particular uh, column and you can iterate the maps over that column so every unique value in that column would then get its own page. However, there is something that provides you a little bit more flexibility and that brings us to our next feature which is called reports. So reports are essentially data-driven pages, uh, but I like to say that they're data-driven pages on steroids. So every report has the option to include both a header and a footer. Uh, and these header and footers are um, uh, layouts. So similar to what we just talked about, you could add um, elements uh, in there. You could add text, you could add map, you could add a number of different things that we'll talk about in the next couple slides. Um, but those things are optional. So as you create your report, if you wanna have a header or you know, essentially a cover page for your report, you can do so. Um, the main um, body of the report uh, are, are within these uh, sections. So the first one we have is a static layout section, which is essentially just a layout that's been embedded into your report. And it's called a static layout section because it doesn't participate in any kind of uh, data-driven pages style uh, iteration. The field group section, on the other hand, is, um, is, is a data-driven page style um, uh, iteration of maps. So what we would commonly think of as the data-driven pages is, is, is actually the body. And then similar to the actual report itself, you can also include a header and a footer or you know, a cover page and an end page for each one of these sections. So over here on the right, you can see that at the, we have the report level at re in red, and then in blue, we have uh, four field group uh, sections, and you can see that they're both nested and stacked uh, on top of each other. So let's see what that looks like in practice. So here we have a report. Um, I will say the link down below is to an excellent blog article. Um, um, North Road, if you aren't already um, reading it on a regular basis and you're using QGIS, you really should. Uh, it's an excellent source of information. Um, so these screen caps all came from that blog article. Uh, so this particular report is actually using uh, data from the country of Mexico. Uh, so the administrative level uh, here in green represents the various states of Mexico. And then underneath of that, we have the next um, section for populated places, or i.e. Uh, cities. Um, so you can see I, um, they actually have uh, header pages for each one of the cities, uh, or for each uh, city section, I should say. And then from there, um, each one of these maps represents a different city. Uh, likewise, for airports, um, they, they have a header and then um, the airports are below and then it chain, uh, uh, switches over to the next state. Uh, I should also say that the way that this works is that these sections that are underneath of this administrative level in this case um, are connected to it. So it's only showing the populated places for the, um, um, the administrative area um, that it belongs to. Okay. Lastly, for, cartog for cartography, let's talk uh, briefly about content. Um, so QGIS offers much of the same type of things that you would see in um, ArcGIS, you know, desktop or pro. 
Um, you know, you have your standard fair mapping elements with legend, north arrow, scale, scale bar, neat, neat line. Um, you can also mix uh, together 2D and 3D map views in the same composition or the same layout, uh, which is really nice. And then down here, you'll notice uh, you can also embed an HTML uh, website. So in this case, the map you see over here on the right hand side um, has the, um, the web page for Baltimore County government embedded directly within the map itself. And as you resize it, it'll use the responsiveness of the website to display the information accordingly. Um, then below that, we also have attribute table. Uh, so similar to, again, Arc, um, um, Arc Pro in this case, you can embed an attribute table and you can filter that attribute table down by what's visible on the map um, you know, based on an additional query. Um, and then you can also select which fields are displayed uh, and customize the look and feel of the, of the table. Um, and, and I should also point out as well, you can also add um, a, a fixed or a static table as well if you have uh, if you want to manually enter the data. All right, next we're going to go into attributes and editing. So first up we have forms. So forms are a way that you can interact with your data that's an alternative to the traditional uh, attribute table. Um, so when you look at an attribute table, you're essentially looking at an Excel document. Um, you can think of forms more along the lines of something like Microsoft Access, where you create a form um, or even just uh, a more modern example, I guess, uh, you're using a web form to be able to collect information. Um, each, uh, each time you open up a form, that form represents a single um, record. So what uh, forms provide in QGIS is it allows you to set uh, input widgets, which will control um, how the data gets entered into um, that particular record. You can set up constraints for things like whether or not the column is not null, whether or not the column is uh, unique, and you can also set your own custom constraints. So for instance, if you wanna make it so that the, um, the end date is always after the start date, you can have that constraint built into your form to ensure that anyone that's entering data in QGIS uh, follows the business rules that have been established. Um, and lastly, you can add a default value um, and the nice thing about this is it's not just a single um, you know, string value or a number. You can actually set it as an expression to be able to calculate a default value um, actually based on other columns in the data, uh, which is very convenient. All right, uh, we also have the ability to organize columns within the form. So you can change the alias, you can toggle whether they're editable or visible, you can reorder them, and then you can group them together into sections and tabs. So let's take a look at what that uh, looks like in practice. So you can see here I have some some road data in this case it's from Baltimore County um, and then across the top we have a series of tabs. I'm hitting a drop down here and you can see that um, the drop down gives me a list of values. Over on the right hand side of text values you have the little white X. Um, this allows you to actually null out the field uh, which is nice so that you don't end up having uh, empty strings in your data uh, which can be a data validation issue. Um, and then you can see here, there's some additional uh, drop down, just showing you some of the larger uh, drop downs. Okay, next we have quick filtering and calculating of data. So um, th this is actually looking at the attribute table um, for a particular um, uh, layer. Um, and you can see when I hit, when I turn editing on, uh, there was a drop down that, that, that popped up and it gave me a list of columns. Uh, and from here, I can calculate a value quickly with the update all or update selected. Um, and then you can see here, I'm actually calculating update selected in this case, uh, just by selecting the values I wanna change and then hitting the button. Uh, I apologize for some of the things that got cut off. I was trying to keep this as small, uh, as tight as possible to make sure you could see it all. Uh, so down below, um, it's actually doing a filter um, to um, only show certain values. Uh, next up, we have conditional formatting. So this works in almost exactly the same way as you would uh, use it in uh, Microsoft Excel. Uh, for each rule, you can give it a name. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, get, uh, getting it something meaningful. In this case, I'm indicating that the building column is null with the at value uh, uh, parameter. And then you can see there's some presets available, but you could certainly change the, um, the font, the, whether it's bold, italicized, underscore, strike through, so on and so forth. 
Um, so that was a, um, a field only. And then this is for the entire row. Uh, so in this case, it's looking at whether or not the building is not yes. Now I corrected it. Um, so building does not equal yes. And similar to what um, you just saw previously, uh, you can hit the drop down, and there are some uh, presets that you can use, uh, but you do have the ability to completely customize the background color, the text color. Um, uh, you can also add icons as well. Um, and then there you go. Um, from here, uh, it's very responsive. So you can see as I'm uh, clearing out these values or changing the values, uh, it's automatically updating. Um, and this works very well. I will say, in if your data set's very large, uh, this may um, you may experience some lag. Um, but generally speaking, for you know a couple thousand records or you know uh, uh, ten thousand records, you should be fine. Next up, we have symbology. So uh, this first one is a rule-based renderer, um, and I, I apologize, this one is not animated in, in case you're looking for the mouse to move at some point in time. Um, so um, in, you know, typically when you uh, are operating within GIS, a common type of symbology you would use is category. Uh, so you would uh, pick a column and you would say, within that column, I wanna categorize all the unique values. Um, you know, for instance, for a, um, uh, some kind of conditional rating where you would have good, fair, and poor, um, or you might want to group some of those ratings together to simplify the symbology a little bit. So what rule-based renderer actually does is it gives you a, a lot more logic to work with. So you can see here the first um, rule that's been established where the name of this river is um, Antioch River. So any um, record that matches that will then get that symbology. That's pretty straightforward. What's interesting is when we see the next two lines, they're actually indented. So what this means is that these two rules are um, um, underneath of the name equals Antioch River, and they're only going to run underneath of that rule. So only the, the records where Antioch River is the name will these two symbology uh, options take hold. And because we have two different symbologies, it's actually going to run and show the, um, the thin line and then underneath of it, it's going to show the thick line. Uh, so this is where you would actually stack multiple different symbologies, one on top of each other for the same set of records, uh, given a set of rules. And then you can see down at the bottom, you also have an else statement to take care of uh, all of the other values as well. But rule-based renderer, uh, needless to say, provides a lot of flexibility in being able to develop some really unique and uh, customized symbology. So next up, we have the geometry generator. Uh, so keep in mind that these um, symbologies that you see here, this is all being rendered on the fly. Um, so I would recommend if you're working with hundreds of thousands or millions of records to be cautious using this. Um, but geometry generators essentially use the expression builder that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, and I've mentioned a little bit uh, uh, previously, it's um, all based on Python and that PyQGIS um, module that um, uh, Q just provides, but it, it allows you to really um, do some interesting things, let's say, uh, because you're getting access to the geometry record itself, uh, you can do geometry calculations uh, in there. Uh, additionally, you can create uh, things like over here on the right hand side, this is a series of points that are actually being rendered as uh, a series of tables. So instead of an actual point, uh, like a, a marker symbol, what you're seeing is a table with values coming from the actual attributes themselves, which is pretty cool. Um, over on the left-hand side, um, you know, CAD style uh, dimensioning of your polygons. And again, because this is symbology, this is all being rendered on the fly. And then down at the bottom, uh, for each individual vertice within these lines, numbering them from one to uh, whatever the end number is based on the, um, the direction of uh, digit digitization. All right, last for symbology, we have the contour renderer. So typically when you work with DEMs and contours, you would take your DEM and you would generate some contours and then you would pull your contours in, which are that, at that point, no longer raster data, it's vector data and you're gonna symbolize the contours as vector data. So contour, the contour renderer is something that was just 
released fairly recently with QGIS uh, with version uh, 3.14. And this allows you to render a raster as contours. So you can see um, over here on the right, you're uh, being asked to uh, select what the input band is. You can select the contour interval and the index contour um, uh, interval as well, and then set the symbology for it. Uh, and then you have some uh, additional options down below as well. So this is a, a nice way, you know, depending on the size of your DEM and how detailed your DEM is, that you could um, uh, easily create contour symbology without having to create an intermediate file for contours. Next up, we have layers. All right, this, this next feature is pretty simple, um, but I, I use it all the time. So um, on the left-hand side, we have a layers panel uh, similar to what you would see with the table of contents in Arc Desktop um, or the, um, I believe it's called the map contents for Arc Pro. Um, so we do have the option to turn an entire layer on, on and off, but here we also have the option to turn off individual uh, slices of, symb uh, of symbology. In this case, you know, using um, this symbology was set up using a rule-based um, renderer, um, but essentially it'll work on anything that has more than one different uh, uh, categories or um, uh, uh, bits underneath of your uh, symbology. Um, and, I, and, and I should say where this comes in handy, especially if you have uh, quite a few different categories underneath and you want to explore your data a little more, um, or maybe as you zoom in, you want to turn some of them off um, uh, just to be able to you know, see some of the details, um, but still keep the symbology the same, uh, you can do so. Uh, so next, uh, QGIS uh, supports multiple styles for each layer. Uh, so this comes uh, in handy, especially when you're um, dealing with multiple different base maps. Uh, anybody that's you know, switched between something like an, an aerial view and a streets view will know that you can set your symbology up perfectly to work with the aerial data, but then as soon as you switch on the street view, uh, all of your colors get washed out or it just looks, you know, horrible, you know, frankly. Um, so um, that's one, you know, particular use case that you could flip back and forth between the two different symbologies, depending on your, um, um, your base map. Um, additionally, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next one, um, you could use this for setting up um, multiple um, map layouts. So you don't have to duplicate the layer uh, 16 times in order to um, be able to have different layouts that have different symbology. You just put it all on the same table that it's being used and you can flip back and forth between those styles. Uh, so this next feature kind of takes it a little bit further. So these are called map themes. So the idea here is you're you're actually going to group together uh, um, uh, all of the settings underneath of your layers panel. So this means that you can change which layers are turned on or off, and you can also ch uh, change which layers are, um, uh, or uh, the symbology of the layers themselves. And I should say, I keep saying uh, symbology, but I guess it, uh, it's not just symbology. It's also symbology, it's labels, it's the attribute form that we've already talked about. It's all of those things combined together to form the style of the layer. Um, so, you can see as I'm flipping back and forth, obviously it's going from not having a base map to having a base map. Um, and again, uh, just like I was just talking about with the multiple styles, this could be um, very readily used for multiple layouts. Um, it could also be used, again, if you want to, uh, as you zoom in, you want to flip over to a different map style that maybe has aerial data as opposed to street data or something along those lines. Uh, there's a lot of different uses for this particular feature. All right, next for geoprocessing. So this is kind of a small feature, um, but it was introduced in 3.14 and it definitely comes in handy. Um, so typically when you, want, when you run a geoprocessing tool, you export out the tool either as a temporary file or you export it out to some kind of data format like a shape file or you know, out to a database. Um, they've added the option to append the layer, uh, append the results of the geoprocessing um, tool directly onto an existing layer, which is 
will essentially save you an intermediate step where you don't have to export out a temporary file or an intermediate uh, uh, file and you can just um, uh, dump that result right into um, an existing layer. Uh, next, we have the ability to limit the number of features that are actually being ran. Uh, you can see that's it's the second option being shown, limit features processed. Um, so this could come in handy in a, a number of different scenarios. If you're trying out a new uh, geoprocessing tool um, or if you're um, working with a, a very large data set and you want to be able to run through a, a workflow and make sure that everything is working from start to finish, but you don't necessarily want to run, um, you know, all, you know, 500,000, a million records that you're working with, or even a smaller data set. Um, and or you also don't wanna to have to go through and uh, create copies of all of your data and limit that data down to a test you know, set, uh, a set, so to speak. Uh, next is uh, the selected features toggle. This has been around for um, a little while, but um, many of the geoprocessing tools uh, provide a little toggle button uh, and it'll only become uh, visible if that particular layer has uh, features selected. Uh, but it's just a quick way to be able to say, yes, I want to use only the selected features or no, I don't. I know Arc uh, Desktop and Arc Pro has this in some places, but it's much more ubiquitous in um, uh, uh, QGIS and it also allows you to uh, select which one you want to do if you want to just run it against all of them or only the selected features. All right, last section we have is the general section. So first up, we have the data defined overrides. Um, so what these are is it, it, it allows you to uh, use either a field value, uh, a variable, um, which I can talk to um, um, more if you're interested afterwards, uh, but essentially it's uh, like a set of uh, environmental variables at the QGIS level, at the project file level, and at the individual layer level uh, that you could plug in here. Um, and I should say you could also create your own. Um, you can also use an expression. So using the expression builder that we're gonna talk about uh, in the next uh, uh, section, um, or auxiliary data, which um, is kind of beyond this talk, but uh, it is an interesting, bin, uh, an interesting feature that QGIS provides. So you can use any of those to essentially set a parameter within a part of the interface. So this would include, you know, sort of a common um, usage of it within geoprocessing tools, such as, uh, you know, to use an example that's similar to what you would use in ArcGIS, uh, you know, using the buffer tool, you would be able to set a field value to be the size of the buffer. However, QGIS kind of takes it the next step um, in that it embeds it in a lot of other places. So you can see here in the symbology selector, I can set what the size of my marker is gonna be based on um, a field value or a variable or an expression, so on and so forth, and the rotation. Um, you'll see this again in symbology and labeling in diagrams. Um, and then there's also a number of different settings in your print composer, which is how you create your layouts um, that uh, utilize this uh, option here. Next, we have the expression builder. Um, so this allows you to um, uh, leverage the PyQGIS um, uh, geoprocessing language in a lot of different places within um, uh, uh, QGIS. And this is one of my favorite features of uh, QGIS, mainly from the pr perspective that you don't have to learn a bunch of different uh, sets of syntax in order to be able to use um, this expression builder because it's all using the same one and it's being embedded in multiple different places. So whether or not you're selecting by an expression or doing a field calculator or using an expression somewhere in a symbology or labeling uh, uh, parameter, um, as we just discussed, the data defined overrides, every one of those allows you to use an expression. Um, and then you can also use it within your uh, form builder as well when you're setting your custom constraints, your default value, whether or not certain sections are conditionally visible, uh, the actual alias of the column, uh, so on and so forth. So it's, it's really nice that it's kind of this one unified language. And not only is it all the same language that you would use uh, throughout the interface, it's also the same language that you would use when you're um, uh, building scripts as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, um, 
the expression builder uh, provides access to a number of different pretty standard functions working with um, um, numbers and math, date and time, string, you know, um, arrays, a JSON, so on and so forth. Uh, some of the notable functions, so you, you can actually get access directly to files and paths. Uh, so you can check whether or not a file exists or check whether or not a particular path is a file or if it is a directory. Um, you have access to the geometry. So this is how you would actually uh, create or use the geometry generator. You would use the uh, geometry functions in here. So this is similar to the geometry object in, um, in ArcGIS where you have access to things like doing a bounding box or a clip or a buffer on a single geometry and not you know, as a geoprocessing tool. And that's where you can do some pretty sophisticated things. Uh, next, you have the map layers. Uh, so this is kind of unique as well, where you can actually get access to all of the other layers that are in your map. And you can do calculations and pull in values from the other layers in your expressions. And again, you know, try to imagine you know, you're doing a select by expression or you're doing a field calculation and you're able to pull from values from other layers. So it, it, it really increases the utility of you know, this particular uh, uh, tool. Um, I should also say that this list kind of varies depending on where you access the expression builder. Um, so for instance, there, um, the map layers uh, is not going to be available when you're doing something um, uh, from a place where the map layers aren't accessible or the record and attributes is not going to be available from um, you know, something like a, um, the print composer um, because you're not actually accessing a record at that point, you're accessing an entire layout composition. So it is contextual. Uh, the majority of these um, function sets are available across uh, you know, the entire time that you're using the expression builder, I should say. All right, last feature we have is the locator bar. So uh, this is another really cool um, thing that I can't live without in QGIS, but it's not you know, uh, sort of whiz-bang GIS, so to speak. Um, so it's a little search bar down at the bottom left-hand corner. Um, it, it searches not just on the name of things, but also uh, the internals of it. So for instance, this allows you to search on things like the settings, your spatial bookmarks, your current project layers, uh, the geoprocessing tools. And so it won't just look for, um, you know, in this case, project within uh, the name of a particular tool, but also within the parameters and the description of the tool as well. Um, and then you can see the results are then get grouped out by um, each of the various um, uh, uh, headings that you see uh, when you just click in there. Um, again, it's very convenient and it's a nice way to be able to quickly find the tool that you're looking for, especially if you're coming from ArcGIS and you're not quite sure what it is, but you generally know about clips and intersects and buffers and things like that. You can get a list of tools that'll point you in the right direction and settings for that matter. All right. So um, now we're going to shift down a little bit into the, um, the, the final part of the uh, uh, presentation for the Maryland QGIS user group. Um, so this group was started uh, back in 2018 by myself and Ann Kanoon, uh, also from Century Engineering. Uh, so as I said before, Century Engineering, our, and specifically our group, uh, are really big proponents of open source software. Um, Ann Kanoon and I decided to start up a user group to help promote QGIS. Um, beyond just QGIS uh, as a desktop software, we're also interested in promoting related open source technologies. So that would be things like uh, Postgres and GeoServer and open source um, uh, web development and you know, so on and so forth. Um, but the idea is to keep the group um, mostly focused on the QGIS desktop uh, to make it um, more readily useful to the general public uh, as we start expanding this out. So um, with that, um, we had, we've had a number of, of uh, meetings over the years. Um, it kind of went defunct for a little while and we're starting it back up. Uh, so this past uh, September uh, on the 16th, um, we had our first uh, lunch and learn. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, October 21st, we have our next lunch and learn. We're, we're gonna do a 30 minute map uh, in QGIS. And then um, actually our host, um, uh, Bill, is gonna be presenting on number, November 18th uh, for 3D in GIS uh, or QGIS. 
Um, I should also say as a quick shout out to the GIS community, uh, I completely forgot about this, but November 18th is actually uh, GIS day. So it's actually a perfect day to do a lunch and learn. Um, so each lunch and learn is on the third Wednesday of the month from 12 to one. Um, the presentations were shooting for between 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, we're not trying to you know, fill time in, so to speak. So some might be a little shorter, some, some might be a little longer, but we're trying to keep it within the one hour time frame uh, so folks could uh, attend as much as possible. Uh, if you're interested in attending, in uh, presenting, uh, by all means, um, or just want more information, please email us at qgismd at gmail.com and you'll get either myself or Ann, uh, and we'll get back with you. And with that, I will relinquish control and uh, see if you have any questions. All right. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, very, very interesting. Let me, uh, I'm going to actually turn on Todd's talk ability because he's the one that had the, had the questions. I don't know if you saw them. I answered two of the three he had. Uh, his first question was, can profiles be set loaded based on access or security levels? And I did a quick search and there's an authentication method uh, inside of QGIS that uses what, one, two, three, four, five, six different authentication methods. One of them being PKI, which is the one we use here the most. Um, I don't know if you had anything else specific, Todd, that you were asking or whether you, that was trying to get to what you're trying to get to is what was the PKI authentication. Yeah, I was thinking about um, different levels of access authentication. Can they be essentially filtered out based off of the user's access level automatically? So, um, the, so, so we currently use QGIS in an enterprise environment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that in which we use it um, is um, providing um, access to enterprise databases, in our case, uh, Postgres. So every profile has a, an encrypted uh, a database that's stored locally. Um, and that database is where a, an end user would hypothetically store their, um, their credentials for things like databases and web services and APIs and the like. Um, and then as Bill said, it offers a number of different methods of authentication, you know, anywhere from um, username and password all the way up from there. Um, so that's how we've currently used it is that each person sets up their uh, profile essentially. And um, we have, we, we utilize the local um, encrypted database for authentication. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's probably some way to tie into some kind of, um, uh, or I should say there might be some kind of way to tie into a, a, a server application that would be a, 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 a way to centralize authentication in that regards. Um, but we just haven't used it in that regard up until now. Okay, yeah, I was thinking that you can almost have a kind of like a base profile for different levels of users. And then <clears throat> obviously they could take that base profile and expand it but at the same point, it, it sets them up with the ability that they can't um, see other data. Well, so I will say this, and I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with what data sets uh, ESS is currently using or what uh, uh, databases um, you're currently using, but QGIS does integrate very well with Postgres. Mm -hmm. I can't speak directly towards its integration with something like SQL Server or Oracle. Um, or DB2, but um, uh, I know for Postgres, because that authentication, so for instance, if I set up my profile and I have my credentials stored in that database and I say that, you know, uh, you know let's just say that I'm a super user for the database, uh, QGIS will recognize that and it'll allow me to edit anything that my credentials allow me to edit. Now, if I log in, you know, again, through that same um, authentication method, um, and I only have read-only access on the database side. I'm, you know, nothing is being said in QGIS at this point. It's just in the database side, the permissions have been set. QGIS will recognize that and it won't, will not give me uh, the ability to even turn on editing within the interface. It'll actually stop it wholesale, which is really nice, especially when we bring on um, uh, interns or other folk that are, um, uh, that we give access to our data, we can 
be sure because we're centralizing how security is being done uh, uh, through our database that they can access QGIS all they want, but it's not going to give them access, more access than they um, than they need. Okay, good. Yeah, my my first thought when you brought that up, Todd, was, oh, those, that's nice. We had all those uh, standard authentication methods up to the the PKI P12. It needs yep. a blockchain authentication method. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we've got our blockchain network running here at, at the ESS lab. So then it makes me think, well, geez, we could write an extra little uh, module or, or library here that then also connects into the, the blockchain for your yep. authentic. Huh. Yeah. All right, let's see. Todd's other question. Does QGIS handle temporal data natively? Yes. Yeah, and I um, this thing called the temporal controller. Yes. So QGIS um, offers a number of different ways to analyze, uh, animate, and display temporal data, uh, as well as an entire set, uh, a, a data set of tools um, uh, surrounding uh, temporal data. Um, Niall Dawson, uh, the guy that you have in the and the quote there, Bill, he's one of the um, core contributors of QGIS. And in fact, he um, he owns the company North Road that I was mentioning their blog uh, uh, during the presentation, mm -hmm. or at least that's my understanding is that he's the owner. He might be the president or something like that, but he's um, an interesting fella uh, uh, to say the least to be, you know, to own a company, but then he gets into like the C++ level. <laughs> contributing, uh, you know, to the core of QGIS. He's very active in the community. Um, but needless to say, yes, uh, it supports uh, uh, Tempore data. Um, one of the nice things about QGIS is every release that they make, they're adding new stuff all the time. Um, in fact, there's, uh, I believe it's about 20 or 30 things, if I remember correctly, from their uh, visual change log. Um, that are specific to temporal controller that are new features or new, you know, you know, little fixes or new options that they've expanded out for temporal data. Did you have anything uh, specific in mind, Todd, when you, when you think about temporal data? No, I was just wondering if it, if it handled it already, um, just so that you could, you know, it's nice to see timelines a lot of times when you're looking at uh, geospatial data. So. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I, I will say too, I, I didn't I didn't mention it in, in any particular detail, but uh, QGIS does have an active plugin community. Um, I, I, I tried to keep, uh, or I should say, I kept all of the features that you're seeing here to just what's available in QGIS core. Mm -hmm. um, but there are uh, additional plugins that are available for QGIS that do, um, you know, working with um, various data sets, adding different functionality, expanding on existing geoprocessing tools. Um, and, you know, th there's, there's been quite a bit of precedence for certain plugins that were maintained for a number of years, and then eventually they get integrated directly into the core and just become a part of QGIS proper. Okay. All right, and then Todd's last question was, does the search work on dynamic data, data feeds for alerting capabilities? And I think um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Well, I mean, you asked the question when you were showing the the last thing you, you had on your feature list, the uh, the search uh, the box. Yes, I was just thinking: is there a way? Because that one, I assume, is you're searching all the layers uh, that you have there at the time. Um, but I was just thinking for alerting capabilities. Uh, especially with dynamic data that you could set up alerts for, you know, fencing or any other parameters that if some value changed in the data, um, it could trigger uh, an alert. That I'm not, I, I, I don't think that that would get you where you were looking to go. Um, this is mainly just going to be what's in the interface. Um, I, I don't think this is necessarily where you're looking to go either, but there is, I'm just moving over. It's, um, or I, I should say, I'm not sure why I'm, I'm moving over because it's been cut off, but there is an option under, uh, it's, I believe it's under metadata or web where mm -hmm. you can connect uh, to services that um, 
uh, similar to like a data catalog. Now that's not necessarily doing like geofencing or, um, you know, uh, uh, triggers from the data, uh, but you can search on uh, data within like a data catalog, something like an NDI map type of uh, scenario uh, direct, directly within QGIS. Um, I can't remember what the protocol that they use for that, but uh, yeah. So what if, what if you had the OpenStreetMap WFS or WMS loaded, so it becomes part of your project's layers and you wanted to try to figure out or get an alert that the data has been updated? I don't. I don't know if QGIS would be able to handle that. I, I mean, I, I know that whatever data that you have in there is going to be dynamic. It'll be updated um, as it, you know, as it gets updated. Um, but I don't know that QGIS provides a particular mechanism for that. Um, I will say that there may be something in PyQGIS uh, because there are quite a few, uh, or as I was saying before, PyQGIS uh, or PyQGIS um, has, um, exposes a lot more of the interface than through something like ArcGIS where you can get access to uh, essentially like event handlers. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there's an event handler in PyQGIS for something like um, dynamic data set that gets updated, but that's uh, certainly possible. I thought there was a, a open file geodatabase format. Have you heard of that? Yes, so technically the file geo database is, is, is an open format at this point. The, however, it comes with limitations. So basically like everything that you would think to use it for in ArcGIS is not a part of that open format. So what the open format allows you uh, access to or allows you to use is the database itself as well as simple tables you know, or IE, you know, uh, feature classes and tables. So things like relationship classes, domains, topology, network um, um, analysis, um, you know, w within a feature data set, all of that is proprietary. Uh, so it really, it's just, you have the ability to look at your data. Um, there are two different uh, drivers for uh, File Geo Database. Uh, for QGIS, uh, by default, it's going to use the Open File Geo Database driver, which rests, you know, strictly on that open definition. Uh, and I believe there is a proprietary driver that's supported by Esri that allows for editing of File Geo Databases without uh, some of those extra bits and pieces. But I'd have to look at it again. It's been a little while since I've I've looked at it. But I know that there's definitely two different drivers that QGIS offers. Um, with that. Okay. All right. Well, Todd, do you have anything else? That's about all I have. All okay. right. Well, Sean, again, thank you very much. Uh, it was very uh, nice to have all that laid out for us. Uh, I am going to be, I've recorded this session and I'm going to make it available to some other people I know that want to view it as well. Um, I'll send you a copy of the uh, recording once I get that done. Okay. You can post it wherever you want as well. So. Yeah, no, wor no worries. Thank you so much. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a good day. Take care.